answer is um, these tools were developed by a small number of people, particularly Sarah Arsef and um, Doug Makino, and they did such a good job of developing things in this particular direction that there's been relatively little motivation to uh, switch. Okay, so just to clarify, so it is a time symmetry of the operation. No. Uh, so first, this is not this is not time symmetric. The modified Euler is not time symmetric because it's a drift and then a kick. It is symplectic. Uh, so the you can't prove anything. The rule of thumb is that um, if you have a, an integrator which is either time symmetric or symplectic or both you won't get any growth in the energy error. Uh, this one's symplectic, but not time reversible. This one's symplectic and time reversible. This one is neither. And shortly I'll be showing you one for time symmetric, but not symplectic. And so either of those two geometric properties seems to be sufficient, um, but there are no proofs. Do you get any benefit from swapping the operator board? Operator uh, ordering every time step. What if I do need to kick for it to the next time step? Uh, that would be the problem. So, yes, it turns into the second order. Um, okay, so. Um, Sorry. Is there any negative side effect to the operator speeding? Because that's not quite the. the what needs to go to this? Um, well, I mean, there's a disadvantage to any numerical algorithm because that's not what nature does, right? Uh, so, you know, you, you've got some approximation whether you're using Ramakata or operator splitting or anything else. Every numerical method has advantages and disadvantages. The principal disadvantage for this, which I'll talk about now, is uh, variable time stuff. Um, so let me just do that many. That doesn't answer the question. Um, the, the dark secret of uh, uh, symplectic integrators uh, in general, in particular, is that it's hard to vary the time step. And the reason for that um, is actually pretty simple to see. If you uh, if I go back to the original derivation of these things uh, and I said let's imagine that I have a time step H that depends on the position of the Of course that's what you do when you vary the time step. You change the time step depending on where you are in phase space. Uh, when you do that and I write the Hamiltonian as H equals a half T squared plus the potential times delta H of T. Uh, when H was fixed, Hamilton's equation said dP dt is minus dH dQ, which was minus frac phi Q delta H. But now that H depends on Q and P, if I'm really going to make a Hamiltonian, I have to add a term which is phi of q times delta, well, I have to, using the definition, I have to write this as dh dq times an infinite sum of delta functions plus h times a sum of delta prime t minus jh times minus j dh dq. As you can see, this is uh, uh, pretty much the mess. What I'm suggesting is not that you try to work this out because you really will get a mess, but you can't just um, keep a symplectic integrator where uh, you vary h every time step. Um, so if you're going to have a variable time step, you have to be very careful about how you do it. Many people have tried uh, methods of varying the time step um, in leapfrog, and I'll suggest 
two of the simple ones that seem to work reasonably well. Uh, and the idea behind both of them is that if you want variable time spent, um, give up on being symplectic. <coughs> uh, but try to keep time reversibility. Because it's a lot easier to keep time reversibility. Um, so remember, leapfrog is both uh, time reversible and symplectic. Uh, is there a way you can write down leapfrog that will keep the time reversibility? The answer is yes. Um, so again, I'll write, I'll follow this. Q a half is Q plus a half HP. Then I'll introduce P one half is P minus um, H over two rad five at um, Q a half. Um, I'm going to switch with the variable time step from time step H to a new time step H prime. So uh, I'll now say P prime is P one half minus H prime over two rad five Q one half. And finally Q prime is Q one half plus one half H prime. Um, that's not sufficient to make it time reversible. You have to be careful about how you change the time step. Um, and uh, so rather than, since I've got too many H's around, let's suppose that you have some criteria that says I'd like the time step to be some tau of Q and P. Then your algorithm should be introduce a new function U H h prime, which is uh, tau of q1 half, p1 half, and all you have to assume is that this is symmetric. So for example, I could make u h plus h prime over 2. Then what you do as you work forward, you start with some time step carry out these two steps, you know H, you now know P one half and Q one half, you substitute in here, you solve for H prime, stick H prime in here and go forward. And if you think about this and stare at it for a little while, this is a completely time symmetric um, operator. Oh. It's a time symmetric. It reverses the standard leapfrog in the case where the time steps don't change. But why would you want to change the time step halfway through the step as opposed to waiting until the end of the step and then changing it? Then it's because because then it wouldn't be time symmetric because um, the time step, when you go forward in time, the time steps determine here at the start of the step. If you try to go back, the time step would be determined down here. And so you, when you reverse it, come through the same time as they would have time step. Okay, there is a second uh, way to do this, um, which, um, which I'm going to describe um, just because it's so clever that uh, it's, uh, it's worth thinking about. Um, it comes from a paper um, by Nicola and Merritt. Uh, so Dave should really be the one to describe it. Um, and this is a way of uh, making any integrator time symmetric, not just leapfrog. Um, so let's imagine that I've got any integrator, and the integrator says that y of t plus h is y of t plus some operator g sub h y of t. And I'd like to convert this into a uh, symmetric operator. Well, the first thing you do is you 
So I'm starting with some y. I define a new variable z, which is equal to y. And then, uh, as in leapfrog, I write y one half is y plus a half time step of g operating on z. Then z one half is z minus g of minus h over 2 y. And then I do the same thing here. Uh, u of h, h prime is tau y one half and z prime is z one half plus g h over 2 y one half and y prime is y one half minus g minus h over 2 z one half. Um, and if you stare at that long enough, you'll realize it's completely time symmetric. Uh, and work. so I can stick in, for example, a run a cut operator and go through this and have a time symmetric uh, uh, operator. Uh, do I see Dave? No, okay. So you'll have to ask him how he thought of it because I sure know it would. Um, just to show you um, how this works in practice, uh, this is the same problem I uh, showed you before. Um, except um, I've increased the eccentricity. Um, the reason for increasing the eccentricity of the particle is that in an eccentric orbit, um, you really do want to follow things with smaller time steps uh, close to the center, close to uh, paracenter. Um, this is um, uh, the black curve is standard leapfrog, you know, which works uh, okay, but you'd like to be able to use variable time step. If you just vary the time step on leapfrog, you get the blue curve, which in which you've lost all the advantages of uh, being symplectic. If you do the time symmetric leapfrog in the form that I described, you recover the absolutely flat uh, energy errors. So there are ways to make leapfrog with uh, variable time step, but um, you have to be very careful about it. Um, OK. Um, let me now go on to the question of how to um, use these integrators in real uh, planetary systems on integrators. Um, in order to describe that, I'd like to go through the derivation quickly one more time in a slightly more general form. Um, okay, so let's this time imagine, not that I have a specific form for the Hamiltonian, but I just have a Hamiltonian depends on the Q and P. That's the sum of two terms. H A and B, and I'm going to assume that H A and H B are separately integral, integrable. That is, I can find an analytic solution um, for the motion under either of these two uh, Hamiltonians individually. Um, and since I can, I can write a mapping which says that um, and the function A depends on the phase space coordinates that represents motion under HA for time H under HA for time step H. Similarly, BH represents motion under HB for time step H. Um, so for example, if this is the kinetic energy 
this potential energy, this would be the drift operator, um, and that would be the, the kick operator. Um, and leapfrog would be A, H over 2, E H, H over 2. Um, so if I'm trying to do a planetary system problem for the Hamiltonian, is a half p squared minus g m over q plus some small parameter epsilon and sometimes some additional uh, uh, potential depends on position. I'd say, okay, this is H A, this is H B, uh, this is leapfrog, and I go ahead and do the integration. Um, <coughs> and that will give an error per step. It's an order H2 because it's a second order. <coughs> um, however, there was a um, really wonderful insight into this dating back to the paper by Wisdom and Holman in uh, 1991. It said, well, all you care about is that the split is between two integral Hamiltonians. So why not make this HA and this HB? Um, this is the Kepler Hamiltonian, which you can integrate analytically. Um, and then HB is smaller than HA by order epsilon. Well, clearly, if epsilon were zero, um, the integrator would have no errors at all. So if epsilon is small, the errors should be a lot smaller than in standard leapfrog. And in fact, that's true. Here are the errors are order of epsilon HQ. Uh, how you do this in practice? Um, well, again, this is the Kepler potential. Um, we talked last time about the Gauss H and G functions, or F and G functions, which allow you to advance along an orbit. And so AH. just the Gauss is advanced using the Gauss F and G functions. And VH is just the standard kick operator, but only with the small perturbing potential. Um, the other way to look at this is that there are two natural sets of coordinates to use for any dynamical problem having to do with a planetary system. One is Cartesian coordinates, and one is action angle variables, or the long A elements, or orbital elements. Um, if you're using orbital elements, the integral um, or under HA is trivial. All you're doing is advancing the mean anomaly. If you use Cartesian coordinates, the integral, the action of HB is trivial. It's just a kick. So all you're really doing in the integrator is switching back and forth between two sets of coordinates um, in which different parts of the Hamiltonian are trivial to integrate. So you start in Cartesian coordinates, give it a kick, convert to orbital elements, advance the mean anomaly, uh, convert back to Cartesian coordinates, give it another kick, and so forth and so on. Um, the reason that this um, was so influential is that um, uh, it basically increased not only increase the speed of the integrations uh, by a factor of 10 or so in one stroke, but even more importantly, it actually made it feasible, I think, to uh, the first time to integrate uh, planetary systems for times comparable to uh, their actual lifetimes. Um, and by now, I'd say that it's very rare to see um, any long planetary system integration it isn't using uh, this method. Um, there are a few additional features of it um, that are worth uh, noticing. One uh, minor problem which I've glossed over is that um, if you're doing an n-body system like a planetary system, uh, you can't really do this in uh, standard Cartesian uh, heliocentric or barocentric coordinates, you have to use a slightly more complicated system of called Jacobi coordinates. I'm not going to go into the details of uh, 
for those coordinates, it doesn't seem to affect the efficiency of the integration at all. Um, if you're doing this for a system like the solar system, um, you want to use individual time steps uh, for each planet. Um, that is, you want to integrate Mercury with a much smaller time step than Neptune. But it's straightforward to generalize this uh, operator splitting uh, approach to uh, individual time steps for different planets. It's straightforward to include uh, relativistic corrections uh, along of the form that um, uh, they merit um, described there not that can't be written in terms of the potential, but again, it's easy to modify this to include relativistic uh, corrections. Um, the other point is that um, it's often useful to use a technique which is sometimes called warm up. Um, the idea of warm up. Um, anthropomorphically is like any time you're going to exercise you should warm up carefully. Uh, what that means in practice is that instead of just starting the integration with the final time step that you want to use to run as fast as possible, you should jog a little first. That is, you should uh, go slowly with a very small time step and adiabatically increase the time step up to the final value that you want to use. The reason for that is that that adiabatically changes the Hamiltonian from the real Hamiltonian uh, to the sort of numerical Hamiltonian. Uh, adiabatic changes conserve the actions, and that helps to conserve the frequencies of all the planets. And in fact, you can show that when you do that, you uh, improve the error over the long term or x squared HD, which is also uh, a pretty useful uh, improvement. Um, the final thing to say about uh, final thing to say about the Holman method or symplectic uh, uh, integrators uh, in general is that, and I'm not sure if this is a bug or a feature, but um, they do change your philosophy of uh, what you're trying to accomplish in the integration in a standard integration, you know what you're trying to do is to get the final body as close as possible with the correct position uh, at the end of the integration. If you talk to people who do these integrations, that's not exactly what they'll say. What they'll say is that a geometric integration is a problem from an approximate solution in the exact Hamiltonian to an exact solution in the approximate Hamiltonian. And then the question is, is the difference between the approximate Hamiltonian and the real Hamiltonian a reason, you know, is it a reasonable difference? That is what they would argue is, well, at the end of a, one of these integrations, I haven't really got you know, all the planets in the right position, but I've integrated a planetary system which is really close to the one that we actually started with, and so the results for one that's really close to the one we started with should be just as relevant as for the one we actually start with. So there's a little bit of uh, philosophical worry about exactly what these guys um, uh, are claiming to do and, and when you can say that, um, that they made a mistake. So we just have to be slightly cautious about this. Uh, the other thing, uh, just in terms of names, uh, these are often called mixed variable symplectic methods. Um, because again, this reflects uh, the basic feature that they're symplectic and that the heart of the method is flipping back and forth at every time step between Cartesian coordinates and uh, 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 in orbital elements. Okay, the, the final subject I wanted to talk about on numerical methods is uh, regularization. Um, this is a subject on which I know less than either of the other lecturers, so it's a little strange that I'm talking about it, but um, uh, I won't try to say too much. Um, the wisdom Holman method um, works really well for systems like the solar system that you're trying to follow for a very long time, in which the orbits are well separated, low eccentricity, low inclination. 
Um, however, in many cases, for example, uh, the, the, the ones that Dave Merritt was talking about uh, earlier today, you have to deal with highly eccentric orbits. They're important for planetary systems because it may well be that hot Jupiters form from high eccentricity orbits. They're important for um, uh, stars around black holes. The problem is that the Kepler potential grows so quickly um, near the center that it's actually very hard to um, uh, integrate orbits close to um, with high eccentricities. So what I recommend um, as an exercise is just take your favorite integrator and integrate an orbit at eccentricity 0.9 and then 0.99 and then 0.999 and then 9 uh, and then 9. And let me say that you know for the, the problems that we're uh, uh, talking about in this workshop, these are not unreasonable numbers. So pick an integrator, you know, pick it in Mathematica or MATLAB or whatever you want, try it and see what happens. And it's usually a sobering uh, experience. Um, this has led to the idea that you should regularize. And by regularize, uh, we mean um, change the coordinates to eliminate the singularity of our equal zero. Again, the philosophy here is that no matter how well designed your orbit integrator is, uh, with a variable time step that should allow it to follow things close to the center, um, you're better off um, not relying on the orbit integrator, you're better off rewriting the equations of motion so that you analytically get rid of the singularity. Um, the equations of motion, again, I can think of as accelerations minus GM over R cube R plus some small extra perturbing force. Because if the extra perturbing forces weren't there, obviously you could do everything analytically. Um, there are a variety of techniques for normalizing. Um, the simplest uh, is usually called um, Rudé-Hegge regularization. Uh, and the idea here is to leave the coordinates the same, but all you're going to try to do is change the time. In particular, you're going to introduce a fictitious time related to the real time by dt is r Tau. And the motivate, the, if you think about this for a little bit, what you're really doing um, is converting from time to eccentric anomaly because you recall that um, Kepler's equation says L is um, U minus E sine U. So dl, which is the mean motion times dt, is 1 minus e cos u to u. And for the definition of eccentric anomaly, this is the radius times d u over a. So apart from these constant normalizations, the fictitious time is basically the eccentric anomaly. Uh, and what you can do is then take this equation, uh, use standard uh, algebra and calculus to change from time derivatives to derivatives with respect to tau. And I won't go through that algebra, um, although it's um, pretty straightforward. I'll just write the result, which is the d squared r d tau squared minus 2e r is minus gm E plus the perturbing force times R squared. This is just the standard um, energy. E 
is a half e squared minus gm over r. And this is just the eccentricity vector. Why is this equation better? Well, if you forget about the perturbing uh, force, this is just, the left-hand side is just the equation for a harmonic oscillator. The right-hand side is just a constant force. So you've converted this singular equation, um, which blows up when r equals zero, to a harmonic oscillator uh, equation, which is perfectly well behaved if the, uh, if the motion goes through zero. This equation and this equation are um, exactly equivalent. Um, in addition to this, you have to write down equations for the e by d tau because it's affected by the perturbing force and for the rate of change of the eccentricity vector with respect to tau. Those are straightforward to write down. I'll write them down in the notes. Um, but <coughs> the main thing to recognize is that these aren't going to be singular. Um, uh, near the origin, the harmonic oscillator equation is not singular, and so the whole uh, system is well behaved, even if um, the eccentricity is, is supposed to be the um, There is a second uh, standard form of regularization um, called kusten Evil regularization. Uh, this is more elaborate. It um, not only uh, changes the, the time coordinate, it replaces the Keplerian three vector with a vector in the four dimensional space. Um, so there's some redundancy. The reason for this is that there is a, a symmetry in the Kepler problem which makes it isomorphic for the four-dimensional harmonic oscillator. And uh, that means that you get what are effectively a set of harmonic oscillator equations uh, in four dimensions as well. Um, you can ask, why should you go through this? It's more uh, complicated than uh, simply changing the time. And I think the only answer I know is that it actually does seem to work uh, somewhat better than just changing the time. Uh, I have one example. Um, So this is an orbit with uh, um, a periapsis passage with a relatively modest eccentricity. Um, energy, fractional energy error is a function of the number of force evaluations. Um, this is just standard uh, from the cutter method, as you can see. Um, doesn't do all that well. Again, for one orbit, you need um, thousands of force evaluations to get uh, to respectable energy errors. Using the um, time reversible leapfrog, the variable time step that I described earlier, you can buy two or three orders of magnitude. Per day, Hege regularization, uh, again, just with a standard off the shelf from the cutout integrator, gives you another couple of orders of magnitude. And Kustenheim or Schiefel regularization does even better. So it, you know, my limited experience is that it really is true that you will always do better with regularization than with any integrator, no matter how fancy. Um, but if you've done this more than me, is that an accurate? Uh, I, I think that's fair, actually. I mean, I was going to commend anybody to use uh, the regularization that you kind of learned my name in the group. And I think well, one of the reasons which is usually um, reported at this point is that the, the parts of the entire variable of the key is in, in, in that regularization is half of the Mm -hmm. uh, or the same number of integration sets, one part is much better. Right. Okay. I have to turn this question. So you have the lead cross with variable time step, and it seems like it's behaving incredibly well, the low number of first values, but it seems like something kicked in and made it less so, like there was some sort of other limit that... Uh, I agree. I have no idea. Um, in the previous section, we introduced this idea that you could go for your splitting and actually solve for the Kepler parts. 
analytically, but in that case, would you still need regularization? Because you have an analytical solution that's exact for that. Um, that's a very reasonable question. Um, I haven't done experiments with this, but um, others have, in particular Kevin Rout. And it turns out that, that, so first of all, you have to go to variable time step. Um, and it turns out that, that um, it doesn't, it still doesn't work spectacularly well. That is, when you go to very high eccentricity, I think, unless you, um, there, there's, a, there's a criterion which I've forgotten. But I, I agree, the natural expectation is that the mixed variable methods would completely fix the problem, even at high eccentricity, and they don't. I'm sorry? Is there a way to stitch on the regularization and not the mixed variable? Um, well, sure, in the sense that uh, you could do mixed variable. You know, the the three-dimensional, four-dimensional harmonic oscillator is analytic, and so you could put on a, um, uh, you could easily make that mixed variable and so yes, sounds like, sound like a good project for this uh, uh, for this school. First of all, you're saying depending on the problem heights, and you're not able to switch to one or the other. Uh, I'm saying that um, if you're going to very high eccentricities, I think you're almost always better off regularizing. Yeah, I think I think that's regularization really does work remarkably well. Yeah, that's right. You can go, you know, if, you're, if, if you want to go straight through the origin, it's really a good way. <laughs> uh, can't be deep. Um, okay. Um, okay, so um, let me, in the last uh, 15 minutes, let me go on, let me leave the numerical techniques and go on to the um, the physical question of what's going on in uh, 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 planetary systems, that is, uh, for the planetary flavor of the gravitational end body problem. Um, so everybody here, all of the lectures are doing gravitational end body problem. Uh, the things that are distinguishing uh, planets from galaxies and globular clusters um, are that first um, there's a dominant point mass as there is when you're doing a uh, motion, motion near a central black hole. Second, there's far more orbits, even in the case in the cases that um, Dave Merritt is talking about. It's tough enough for maybe dealing with millions of orbits, but in planetary systems, you're dealing with up to uh, 10 to the 11th orbits. Um, what helps you is that. Um, Typically, in most cases, the orbits are not that far from the circular or coplanar, and secondly, the orbits typically don't cross. The reason they typically don't cross is simply that there's a lot of orbits, planets are relatively big, and the orbits that cross collided long ago and uh, aren't there anymore. So there are advantages and disadvantages to dealing with uh, planets. The equations of motion for the n-body problem, of course, you've seen before, times the sum over j of n to j. Um, for n planets, you've really got an n plus one body problem because it's a central star. So usually you write this as j equals zero to n with n zero equals the star. Um, these equations are not um, ideally suited. Um, these are equations in an arbitrary inertial frame, but you know that there's conservation of the center of mass, and it's in a lot of cases reasonable to put the star at the origin. So you define what in the solar system the heliocentric coordinates, which is the difference between the position of the planet and the position of the sun, and then you get xi t squared is uh, minus g and zero plus mi over xi q. 
to that sign, plus the contribution from the other planets, J not equal to I, J equals 1 to M, G M J, plus J plus I, Q plus minus an additional acceleration, J equals 1, J not equal to I, up to M, G and J, X This is the uh, fictitious force, which is arising because we're in a heliocentric frame, and the sun is accelerating uh, due to the motions of all the other bodies. Uh, it's usually a little simpler to write this in terms of the potential threat phi and the expression for the potential is the Kepler piece minus g zero plus minus the direct potential j equals 1 to m g m j x j minus x i um, plus some j equals 1 to m g m j x j dot x i that's the value of x j um, this extra piece is called the indirect potential. And again, it arises if and only if you work in a heliocentric frame. Um, the only other thing to notice about this is that, uh, of course, by working in a heliocentric frame, the uh, Kepler's law involves not just the mass of the sun, but the mass of the sun plus whatever planet. Uh, natural questions if you're doing an integration, which one should we use? Um, most of the time, in most cases, you're better off using this. Partly there's one fewer equation. Partly um, this, the massive body is always at the center, which makes it a lot easier to keep track of the orbital elements. Um, but there are cases where you really don't want to use this. Um, I'm particularly sensitive to this because uh, I, at one stage, was trying to do a numerical integration of the orbit of the, the comets. Uh, so here's the uh, planetary system. There's, say, Jupiter. Uh, the comets out here. Uh, the comets in an orbit with an orbital period of maybe a million years. I'm trying to integrate the comet orbit, and my time step um, is a few months. Um, why is the do I need a time step of a few months to integrate an orbit with a million years? Well, because I was in the heliocentric frame. Since the heli I was in the heliocentric frame, the sun was oscillating with a period of five years uh, because it was traveling around the common barycenter with Jupiter. That meant that the uh, indirect potential uh, was oscillating with a period of a few years. And so I was following with very short time steps these totally meaningless oscillations of the comet due to the fact that I was in a heliocentric frame. So typically, if you're doing something a long way outside the planets, you really don't want to be in a heliocentric frame um, unless you've got a lot of money to burn. Um, okay, the, um, there are a variety of problems that you'd like to study uh, in the um, uh, gravitational antibody problem, but let me just start by giving a summary of what we know about the, the mother of all problems in this subject, which is the stability of the solar system. Um, this is possibly the oldest uh, problem in theoretical physics. Um, Newton was able to solve the two-body problem, but not surprisingly, he wasn't able to solve the uh, in-body problem. And the question that he asked himself was, uh, 
whether the small oscillations in the planetary orbits introduced by, by this term, whether mutual perturbations would just continue to oscillate or would slowly grow so that eventually the eccentricities would become uh, large and you'd have catastrophic events like planets uh, falling into the sun and, um, uh, or, or colliding. Uh, so Newton did think about this. He had an opinion. Uh, unfortunately, his opinion was tied up with his uh, theology, which was uh, somewhat uh, complicated. And uh, you may remember from your uh, religion 101 classes that there's a difference between theists and deists. And I had to go look this up. Uh, a theist is somebody who believes that God, they both believe in God, uh, but the theist believes that God has to intervene continuously in the workings of the universe, that God actually takes an active role in uh, managing the workings of the universe. The deist believes that God set up a set of immutable uh, laws that govern the universe, and once he had set these up, uh, he left everything alone. Um, Newton, as it turns out, uh, was a theist. Um, and so Newton believed that God continued to intervene in the workings of the universe, um, and in fact believed that um, the solar system was unstable, that the, uh, these perturbations would cause the eccentricities of the, uh, the planets to grow, um, the solar system to become more irregular, and that God had to intervene to keep it um, stable. Uh, so, if you like, he believed that God had a service contract uh, with the solar system. Um, Leibniz had, you know, so you know, we know Leibniz and Newton had other issues, right? Because they had disputes over who invented the calculus. Leibniz was German, was English, and so on. But the other problem is that Leibniz was a deist. And the deist believed that once God had set up uh, the equations of motion for the solar system, uh, it was just going to run perfectly. And um, there's a wonderful quote from some letter from uh, Leibniz who says, uh, Sir Isaac Newton and his followers have a very odd opinion concerning the work of God. Um, according to their doctrine, God Almighty needs to wind up his watch from time to time. Otherwise, it would cease to move. He had not, it seems, sufficient foresight to make it a perpetual motion. Um, so, okay, so. There we have it, the two uh, opposing views of uh, uh, stability of the solar system. Um, since that time, many famous mathematicians and physicists have worked on it. You know, uh, Poincaré, Poisson, Lombas, Lagrange, Kolmogorov, Arnold, and so forth. And so on. the problem gave rise to perturbation theory. It gave rise to much of nonlinear mechanics. Uh, uh, but you know the basic point is that um, you can't prove. Although these guys have proved some really powerful uh, theorems, they can't really prove anything about the stability of the solar system because they have to assume um, idealized systems in which the eccentricities and inclinations and planetary masses are much too small. So the only thing you can do to study the stability of the solar system is um, numerical integrations. Um, these first became feasible for the times you want, and the times you want are minus 4.5 gig years back to the birth of the system, and plus about 7 to 8 gig years, at which point the sun turns into a red giant and swallows up uh, Mercury and Venus and maybe the Earth, and so at that point, well, and there's a lot of mass loss, so all bets are off. Um, so, the technology for doing this first became feasible about 10 years, partly because of Moore's law, but to a large extent also because of the uh, development of techniques like mixed variable uh, symplectic integrators. Um, when you do integrations for these periods of time, uh, the planets in the solar system anyway are still there. Uh, most of the orbits look uh, pretty similar, um, but um, there are uh, important pieces of behavior that you have to understand. Um, in particular, um, it appears that the orbits of all of the planets 
um, are chaotic. And just let me, just to make sure we're all in agreement, um, I'm going to think of uh, an orbit as being regular um, with a small change in the phase space position, delta x, delta q, or delta p, um, grows linearly with time. And uh, chaotic, uh, if initially it grows linearly with the time, um, but then later um, grows exponentially with time for a time greater than a few times TL, this is the amount of time. Um, the solar system obviously is behaves this way on short time scales. That's why we you know, can predict eclipses and send, uh, uh, send probes to, uh, to the other planets. Um, but when the integrations were done for long enough periods of time, it became clear that the motions of all of the planets are uh, chaotic with the half enough times around uh, 10 to 7 years. Um, this is a remarkable, this is both an interestingly short time and an interestingly long time. It's interestingly long because it's much larger than uh, the orbital time and says that the chaos in a certain sense is very weak. Um, it's interestingly short because if the age of the system is uh, four and a half giga years, then the age of the 4.5 giga years over 10 mega years is about 10 to 200. So the, the detailed positions of the planets, um, the detailed phases are, uh, and in fact, um, the overall future of the solar system is not predictable because of this extreme uh, sensitivity to initial conditions over very long times. Um, the, so what do you learn from this? First, um, as I say, the solar system is not predictable stability is a statistical question that you can only discover by following a large ensemble of systems. Um, second, it says that you can be chaotic uh, but still survive for a time scale much longer than the, the, the reactive time. That is, um, the system, the solar system has obviously sur survived for uh, hundreds of enough times. The reason for that, crudely, is that the chaos is restricted uh, to relatively small regions in phase space because of resonances. So there's chaos in the orbital phases, but chaos in the uh, large-scale eccentricities and inclination centimeter axes is much slower. Um, the only planet that seems to be really susceptible to large changes in its orbital elements um, is Mercury. In about 1% of uh, simulations that are done, uh, Mercury um, has a catastrophic event which uh, um, can lead to collisions with Earth or Venus or uh, some other uh, drastic effect. So all you can really say is that the solar system is stable uh, uh, with a 99% probability. The other conclusion, of course, which uh, Man Foy has already alluded to, is that it could have been unstable in the past. It could have uh, uh, had extra planets which, uh, which were ejected uh, sometime in the past. And just to finish that, let me just show one uh, image from calculations done by Jacques Lascar, who has been uh, most So these are simulations of an ensemble of uh, solar systems. Those are eccentricities of Mercury over uh, five fifty years in the future. You can see that in most cases, it, from its current eccentricity, um, it doesn't fall too much, but there's a small fraction where the eccentricity is getting large enough that it's clear that something drastic uh, can happen. Um, the uh, other thing I should mention um, is that all of these results, partly as a result of the chaos, 
are extremely sensitive to details of uh, the initial configuration of the solar system. Uh, Norm Murray, in particular, has shown that uh, what happens in the outer solar system is a very strong function of small changes in uh, 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 semi-major axes of giant planets. Um, Jacques Lascar has pointed out that if you change one of the PPM parameters, you know, from plus one to minus two, uh, Mercury is lost from the solar system in less than a million years or so. So um, it's very hard to make general statements because the results depend very, very strongly on the detailed resonance structure of the system. So I would say that between Leibniz and, and Newton is more or less a draw. Uh, uh, it is unstable, but um, probably not on a time scale that's relevant to the future of the system. Okay, I'm going to stop there. Yes? Uh, then how can Newton be a theist when he has looked for fundamental laws of the universe? How do you reconcile that? Uh, I have no idea. Uh, this is not <coughs> my uh, uh, subject. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he was a pretty complicated guy. <laughs> Doug. Um, is there any attempt to look at uh, the possible additional items in the interior of Mercury to check the density? Right, so, so it is very reasonable to um, add extra planets and see if there are regions where planets could exist. So you can just take the solar system and add a huge number of test particles and see what survives. Obviously, they'll survive outside Neptune because the Kuiper belt is there. Between Jupiter and Neptune, um, there's essentially no stable orbits with one or two small exceptions and, and objects at the Trojan points and giant planets. Inside Jupiter, there's the asteroid belt. There are some additional regions that could stay stable where the asteroids have been uh, depopulated plausibly because of migration. Um, inside Mercury, there are also possible stable regions. And the uh, reasonable question is how big an object could be there that we wouldn't have discovered yet. And um, my guess, so there, in principle, there could be objects inside Mercury that um, survive. I just want to comment about solar system stable or not. So we did experiment where we boosted the eccentricity of everybody by 10%. That is the, not, not the color of change. And the solar system went busted in the 10 million year time scale. So the idea is that it is probably right at the edge between infinite stability, plus or infinite stability, and instant instability. Um, well, um, so I, that, that sounds reasonable. I tried experiments where we increased the masses of the giant planets by 30% and it blew up. Um, and the reason is that Jupiter and Saturn are close to a 3 to 5 resin, 2 to 5. And when, because of the big M plus little m in the orbital period, you increase the masses a little bit, it shifts in. So it shifted into the resonance and then everything blew up. Um, so I, I agree, but uh, I think it's more of a stretch to say that uh, it's on the edge of instability. That is, to, to make some conclusion about the uh, formation processes from the fact that it's on the edge of instability. Um, because that presumably depends on what happened to the system in the initial million years when there was a lot of gas and other bodies around. I just don't understand that very well. It just sounds amazing in the face space. It's sitting right at the edge. Uh, I have no opinion on what's amazing. <laughs> 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 uh, so you showed test of the uh, accuracy of the solvers on various uh, simple problems. When you, when you do the full solar system on very long time is there any way to monitor errors, or do you basically have to trust what is being established on a simple problem and, and, and trust that it follows the same state? Um, well, of course, in a certain sense, there's no way to mimic er monitor errors because it's chaotic. 
Um, however, and so any errors get amplified. However, there's a very